Welcome here. So glad you're joining us with North Star Church and Central Fellowship. And we just want to be uh, coming before the Lord this morning, drawing into his presence, recognizing these amazing truths that who the Son sets free is free indeed, and recognizing these amazing truths that God has made us for a relationship with him, and that we can have an identity as a son or daughter in God. Let's dwell in these amazing truths and sing together. God be with you. God's story. God's story. So there are lots of parts of God's story, but let's take a look at the whole story. At the beginning of time, God created a perfect home, and he made us in his own image, so we could live there and be close to him. The first two people, Adam and Eve, actually walked and talked with God. They loved God and God loved them. He gave them everything they needed. But unfortunately, God had an enemy, and he tricked Adam and Eve into thinking they didn't really need God. He told them they could take care of themselves. So Adam and Eve stopped trusting God, and they chose to disobey him. When they made that choice, all the wrong things in the world began, like meanness, and sickness, and sadness, and death. Even worse, Adam and Eve's bad choice separated them from God. And that means everybody else who was born after them, which is everyone, 
is separated from God too. But guess what? God didn't want to be separated from us. He loves us. So he planned a great rescue to get rid of the death that keeps us from him. Now, God decided to send the rescuer through a family. And the first two people in the family were named Abraham and Sarah. They had to wait many years for the son God promised them. But God kept his promise and finally, Isaac was born. Through Isaac, God's family got bigger and bigger. But even though they were God's special family, they weren't perfect. Isaac's son Jacob tricked his twin brother Esau. Joseph got thrown into a pit and sold by his own brothers. God asked Moses to save his family, but at first, Moses said no. And the Israelite kings? Huh, they made some really bad choices. But God knew the rescuer would change everything. And he loved his family, even though they messed up. Over and over, he showed them what their rescue would be like by saving his family when they were in trouble, and even telling them what to expect. He told them the rescuer would be a king, and that king would rescue everyone from all the wrong things in the world. All the pain and sadness, even death. Well, finally, hundreds of years later, Jesus the rescuer was born, just like God promised. People were surprised when he showed up as a baby, born in a manger with animals. They expected a mighty warrior. But Jesus was a king, all right, and he showed us what it's like in God's kingdom. Jesus did miracles like make sick people healthy and feed hungry people and even bring dead people back to life. That's because in the kingdom of God, nobody is ever sick or sad or hungry. Nobody dies. And Jesus brought the kingdom of God to us. Then Jesus did something nobody expected. He took our punishment of death. Remember, we deserve to be separated from God by death because we do wrong things. Jesus didn't deserve to die because he was perfect. The exciting part is Jesus came back to life. He completely squashed death. And now, death can't separate us from God anymore. Well, after 40 days, Jesus went back to heaven. But right before Jesus left, he told us that our job is to keep getting to know him and to tell people that he rescued us. That way, others can follow him. Then Jesus rose straight up into the clouds. God's family started out afraid to do this job, but God sent the Holy Spirit to help them and us. The Holy Spirit does things like guide us, teach us, support us, even defend us. The Holy Spirit helped people like John, Lydia, Mary, Phoebe, Timothy, Paul, and lots of others know and follow Jesus. Then they showed others how to follow Jesus. And those people showed others. And those people showed others. And, well, you get the idea. But that's not the end of God's story. God's story is still going, and that means we can be a part of it. And sure, right now, we live in a world where we suffer and die, but one day, Jesus will come back. When he does, he'll recreate a new, perfect world for everyone in God's family. It'll be God's kingdom and an amazing home, just like God planned in the beginning. And that's how we can be a part of God's story. in stories of what they think you're like but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone you're a good, good father it's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who you am, it's who I am, it's who I am. I see many so. 
searching for answers far and wide, but I know we're all searching for answers only you provide because you know just what we need before we say a word. Your good, good Father is who you are, is who you are, is who you are. And I'm loved by you, is who I am, is who I am, is who I am. in all of your ways You are perfect in all of your ways You are perfect in all of your ways to us You are perfect in all of your ways You are perfect in all of your ways You are perfect in all of your ways to us. Love so undeniable I can hardly speak so unexplainable I can hardly think as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still into love 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 your good good father Galatians 5. So Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. But don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Hello, my name is Dave. I am a follower of Jesus. I'm a husband, I'm a father, and I'm a pastor of a church called North Star in a small town of Quinnell. This was how I would introduce myself uh, when I would take these wonderful classes at the Justice Institute in New West or in uh, Prince George. I took one there as well. And they were asking to start the class, who are you? And it was really interesting. And I bucked the trend uh, because everybody just said their name and what they did for work. And just this piece of like, well, I'm going to, I'm first defined by my relationships and uh, that ordering of key relationships. My relationship with God, my relationship with my wife, my relationship with my kids, and then uh, my relationships in work. 
And it was interesting because people, like it's one thing you probably thought, okay, this is church, but now introduce yourself that way at work or at school. And it was interesting. It was this kind of social experiment. Classes weren't too long, so we'd stay in that. But uh, I found that people were actually drawn uh, to connecting with me just by how I described myself. So, some people, there was some disconnect, but there was this piece of like, oh, that's interesting. You went totally different direction here. And this morning, we're going in this direction of being made for relationship. We're talking about this new series, Made for Relationship. We're piggybacking off our former series where we're asking big questions of life in our thinking series. And specifically in our meaning of life, what's the meaning of life? We talked about the meaning of life is truly found in a relationship with God and with others. And there's this part where we are made uh, for relationship. And yes, we're each gifted different ways in which we contribute. But are we, if we define ourselves fundamentally through our relationships, we live with a very different outcome than if we are fundamentally about what we do. And I'll get into that here. So, we are drawing out in this series that we are made for relationship. And specifically, uh, as we're in this COVID season and we're starting to be released into um, relationship on this kind of uh, social distancing, uh, just somewhat more personal level, and we'll get into explaining kind of our church's heart in the, in the benediction announcements, but when it comes to being made for relationship, it matters uh, that we are the body of Christ. We are to be interrelated. And this image of the body of Christ, Christ at the head, and us as functioning parts of the body are to be in relationship one, with one another. So we're looking to draw that out of the key importance that you play as a member of the church, uh, no matter where you come from. If you're coming from this perspective of what's this Christian faith all about, we invite you to come and observe. Why does it matter that we are made for relationship? Our focus in life. Um, if we're focused on our relationships over task, it makes a difference in our life, in the legacy of our life, in our own experiences of our life, in others' experiences of us, and also um, the legacy and impact how we have together as a church. So, big things in mind. Let's go big as far as God's story uh, we did the children's video, uh, God's story. I thought that was a great overview. And if you break up God's story, the Bible, in four different sections, uh, um, there'd be creation. So God created us. God made us. Made us for relationship. Second part of the story is the fall. The fall of humanity. The fall, the brokenness of relationship with God through us, uh, coming through the story of Adam and Eve, uh, doubting God's goodness. Doubting if God actually has our best intention in mind. So there's this, there's this fall of vision of God. It becomes a distorted vision of God. There becomes uh, a fall of the image bearers, of human beings, no longer fully bearing God's image to the fullest. And then there's also a fallenness when it comes to relationship and a loss of divine presence in that experience of ongoing relationship with God. So if there's creation, fall, then there's redemption. And there's this long story beginning with the nation of Israel, starting with Abraham, all the way ultimately getting fulfilled in Jesus. And there's this restoring of the vision of God. We truly see who God is in the person of Jesus. There's a renewal of the image bearers uh, through the cross and the resurrection. Jesus makes us right with God and then the Holy Spirit can come in and renew the image bearers and reestablish our relationship. And the Holy Spirit brings the presence of God into our lives. Creation, fall, redemption, restoration. Uh, there's this piece where God is restoring us fully 
and he's restoring creation fully, and he's restoring relationship fully, and he's restoring relationship with each other fully. And there's this already happening, the kingdom of God is at hand, Jesus announced, and it's not fully yet. Heaven is not fully realized. Heaven and earth haven't fully realized and coming together yet in our lives. So something I want to draw out this morning is that a relationship with God sets us free. A relationship with God sets us free. Let me read some scripture here. Uh, Genesis 1, 27 to 28. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Matthew 6, 31. Don't worry about all these things, Jesus says. What will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. Relationship with God is the whole start. It, a relationship with God sets us free. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 30, Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me be in control of your life. Take my relationship as the defining relationship. Let me teach you because I'm humble and gentle at heart and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. When a we are made for a relationship with God and when that relationship defines our lives first and foremost, it sets us free. Jesus said in John 8.32, it's recorded, uh, he said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. My purpose is that you may have life and life to the full. John 10.10, 10. I'm the good shepherd. And the good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. Galatians 5. This passage we had read to us already this morning. So Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure you stay free. And don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. It goes on. I've called, you've been called to live in freedom. My brothers and sisters... But don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you're always biting and devouring one another, watch out. Verse 22. That's what the Holy Spirit does in our life. A relationship with God. The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's no law against things such as these. A relationship with God sets us free. And that's my experience. And uh, I know many of you in the church have heard my story before and and it's my story. And as I preach, I know God wants me to continue to share my story. And he wants you to continue to share your story with others. And as I share mine, may it encourage you. I grew up in the church. And uh, as I became a teen, I uh, chose to elevate my relationships with my peers as my main affection, as my main guidance. Instead of a relationship with God being my main guiding relationship. It was my relationship with my peers in my teenage years. I was drawn to getting their respect and their approval. I was thinking about this uh, recently and how um, I wasn't concerned about academic success, or, but I was greatly concerned about social success and sporting success. And I was thinking even like as I played at a high level in baseball, uh, there was this year where I just, uh, you know, I, I did really well. 
I was one of the best pitchers in my town. And um, I noticed like I was at the center of things because I was doing well. And that would always, that would always happen kind of in PE class. And I would love that. But um, it was fragile. Because I had a couple other years where I wasn't doing as well. And I kind of was kind of on the fringe of the team. So what did that teach me? It taught me that my approval was found in my performance. And that's the danger that we talked about before and why I kind of went out of my way to show that uh, I'm not defined by what I do, but by uh, who I am in, found in my relationships, primarily first through my relationship as a follower of Jesus. It's been a journey for me. And I'd say that experience in high school was a very harrowing journey. It was, I went through some hard times in high school, and it, it felt like there was this social treadmill I was on, always trying to get approval, and you had to continually work for it. And then I was um, met by God and profoundly impacted through the stories of the church, hearing uh, others' testimonies, and God just seemed so present, and I went, you know what? I've been doing life my way. I've been more concerned about what others think than you think. I haven't really had a story going with you, God, and I, I want to repent of that. I want to turn from that. I say, I believe in you, Jesus. Here's my life. I take charge, and I surrendered it, and I got off that treadmill, and uh, over time, and we've talked about this in past, uh, around this book of Galatians, a grief cycle. The cycle of grief. Let me, let me we're going to bring this up on the screen here. Cycle of grief. Achievement activity. We achieve to provide ourselves with an identity. Secondly, we find our identity. A sense of significance is dependent on what we achieve, so we push on. There's a drivenness that comes. We're driven to achieve more, to make ourselves acceptable to others and ourselves. And then we find acceptance. The sense of acceptance is temporary and fragile. So we go round the cycle again. You're only as good as your last performance. And that was, uh, as I reflect back, some of my experience in my social life, uh, in my high school years, and in my kind of baseball life. And in that, my identity was insecure. It was a cycle of grief I was on. And then when I gave my life to God, I got on a new cycle. Let me bring this cycle up. The cycle of grace, where it all begins with accepted. Instead of having to work for acceptance, if we are made for relationship and our lives are primarily defined by relationship, then this, and this is this whole Christian faith thing of who God is. We start with acceptance. Let me read these Ephesians passages you see on the screen. But God's so rich in mercy, this is who he is, and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, we'd rebelled, we were fallen. Even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It's only by God's grace you've been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all the future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness toward us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. And this is the amazing thing. For God saved you by his grace when you believed. This was my experience in coming to faith. Salvation is found through sheer grace, God's love and acceptance, not what I earned. So all of a sudden, I went going on a different cycle, and you'll see there's this reverse. It's a totally opposite way of the world. And it says this word sustenance. Resources constantly renewed through dependence on God. Resources constantly renewed. So after acceptance, I'm given resources through this relationship with God. That word dependence is, is a key word. Identity. Uh, my identity is rooted in this relationship with, with God, and I get this sense of significance 
through being accepted already. And then comes achievement. Service. We read about that. Out of freedom, we're to love and serve. Not indulge self or sin or the flesh, but we then, out of this grace we've received, we serve. In loving obedience, ministry comes. Instead of this treadmill where you're constantly just trying to keep up to prove your worth, you get off the treadmill completely and you find that there's this overflow. There's this overflow of love. And that was, that was my experience, was that I became alive in a whole new way because of this relationship with God. And all of a sudden, my heart opened up. I had new resources. This God of love, this relationship of love defined me. And out of that, I felt like I could love myself. I felt like I could love others. Uh, in a profound way. And, and truly, creation gets involved there too. And this is the trajectory of this series, Made for Relationship. That this relationship with God, when we let God be God in our life, it defines us. And we move from the fall of alienation, of grief, towards grace and acceptance and being right. And there's this overflow and this is the Christian message. This is the Christian faith. And uh, if you don't have full freedom, uh, there's this, and you've been a follower of Jesus. It's, this is why we do this whole thing called church. This, we come back together as a church, guided through the scriptures, inviting the spirit, listening to the body, and we're encouraged by each other. This is why we need each other. Uh, this is why we practice these practices, whether online social gatherings in this time or now we're going to start um, gathering in person uh, in small, small settings. Uh, we're being discipled. And the more these truths sink into our head, heart, and hands, as we discussed last week, the more there's this movement of freedom. And in my Christian journey, it wasn't always clear that, oh, I was on the cycle of grief, and then now I'm on grace totally. It was like, no, this, this thing has taken time to learn and to be discipled by Jesus. Uh, it's taken prayer. It's taken gathering with the church. It's taken study. It's taken reflection. It's taken God revealing himself through the Spirit. But that's, this is it, is a relationship with God sets us free. And that's why we're focusing on relationship. So what do you do with this? Well, recognize first, are you living by the principles of the grief cycle in where you find your acceptance and grace, or acceptance and identity and your worth and what you do, or are you on the grace cycle? So first thing is recognize, which cycle are you on, the grief cycle or the grace cycle? Realize, secondly, our relationship with God sets us free. And if we're trying to live independently of God, that's not actually how we are meant to live. That's actually an expression of the fall, of rejection, rebellion of God. So I don't know if you've been uh, living life in a way where you've lived in dependence of God, where there's this constant connection with God. That's how we've been meant to live. So there's this piece of realizing, okay, a close relationship with God sets us free. And a third part is that realize we've got to engage with the church. The church is a main way in which we grow in our relationship with God, where we grow in ourselves, where we grow in our understanding. So we've got to place that emphasis uh, coming forward in the next months to go, yes, this is a key, important relationship. We talked about how legacy is at stake. How are the focus of our lives um, is, is central when it goes like relationships are central. And when it comes to the per first and foremost relationship, this relationship with God is going to guide us. It's a simple truth, but a life-changing truth. Relationship with God truly sets us free. That's why Christ came 
and he came to release you. Let's pray together. Lord, you know who needed to hear this message and what part they needed to hear. You know our own hearts and how they come. You know these big truths uh, of how we place our identity and where we place our acceptance. And truly, it's your yoke that should be guiding us. Your teachings are the ones that will set us free. And it's this amazing message that we find redemption through the cross, through the the resurrection, and uh, when we invite you into our life. Holy Spirit, you come and you dwell and you start setting us free. So this morning, uh, I give each person listening, uh, I pray for them. I pray that you be setting them free in new ways. I pray that it will lead to great blessing. I pray that you will be mobilizing the local church across Quenil, across Prince George, across the nation, the nations. Lord, re- help us to renew our relationship with God, to renew our right res- our relationship with each other and with the church, with our neighborhoods, our towns. Lord, may it be it for, may it be for your glory. Set us free in a way that only you can, and we celebrate that this is what you do. And in faith, we proceed into that. And we uh, check those things at the door of the temptations of being defined by what we do or others' view of us. It's you and your acceptance of us that defines us and sets us free. Thank you. Thank you for the fruit you're going to grow in our lives as this saturates and uh, goes into our life more and more. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. We have a wonderful song we're going to lead you in. Let's just bring our hearts before God and praise him. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free, all is free indeed. I'm a child. Yeah.
yes I am It's been good to be together this morning. Uh, my hope is that uh, Christ will be bringing freedom and uh, and we're anticipating that as we gather, he's transforming us. And with that comes more freedom. So uh, just uh, speaking of freedoms, and we're not fully released in this COVID phase two, but there is some releasings. Uh, now, Central Fellowship will be in communication uh, with you as far as what the plan is for Central. When it comes to North Star, uh, hey, we've got some key meetings this week for developing our phase two plan. Uh, so expect to hear from us next Sunday uh, as far as w- what our plan is going through phase two. And here's our heart. Uh, is God's given this vision of following him, seeking to disciple and equip each other, and sharing the gospel, anticipating transformation. So uh, we want how we're responding now to be guided by our vision uh, we want to be caring for each one of you, caring, uh, seeing that the gospel goes through us in our neighborhoods in this summertime season. So expect to hear from us. Uh, that's some of our heart. Uh, may you go forward and uh, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's by his great mercy that we have been born again because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation. So go in great expectation of freedom through this relationship with God. God's blessing on you this week.